he wrote, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ for me, Christ beside me, Christ with win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, and Christ above me. And his Confessio, which was a book he wrote right before he died, and that detailed his life to what we know of. It was about 64 uh, paragraphs. And that's where we get at the benediction when you go to church. It says, may God walk above you uh, to comfort you. God may walk beside you to keep you from straying. And then it goes to be God be all around you. We got that from his work. Um, he was never canonized by a pope because when you become a saint after you die, you go through this like revision process of your life of, oh, this person did this, they acted in this way, and it usually that process begins five years after you died. However, back in his time, there was no review process. There was just a church that would say, oh, this person lived a good life, so therefore they'll become a saint. And, but now you have to be, the Pope, like you go through the bishops, your review process, then you go through the cardinals, and then all, if you get far enough all the way to the Pope, like Saint, like um, Mother Teresa, eventually became Saint Teresa. And however, he's still considered a saint today because of acclamation, and acclamation is where people just say, oh, he did live a saintly life, so therefore we'll still call him a saint, even though he never is technically a saint. A saint. Um, this can the canonization process did not start till the 12th century and he was in the first century so it took a long time to get that process going um, so because he became a saint was mainly because of his teaching it wasn't that he was the holiest person that lived during that time or he uh, just knew so much about the Bible and knew so much about God and wrote tons of books like other saints did to some degree he became a saint because of his, chief, his teachings. He started off teaching to the chieftains of the clan, especially to the, the chieftain of the clan that captured him when he was a boy. That's the one he started out with. And then he moved throughout Ireland. Um, on the map, there is a map of uh, that's broken into the different clans of Ireland. And it just says where there's a lot of clans, where there's not as many. But he went throughout the area because he figured if I can teach to the chieftain, then they can convince their followers or their people to go the same way. And he did, that's how he won a lot of the nation. Um, he was the best suited one minister or priest to go to Ireland because he knew the language because of when he was captured at 16. Even though it was the same as the um, rest of Britain, it was still a little bit different. He knew their thought process and how like their clans were set up and how like the political and social mindset that the people had and he also knew a lot about the area in one way that he used, there's a lot of legends that go along with St. Patrick and his teachings and so we'll talk about the first one is the shamrock the shamrock was used by um, St. Patrick to teach because he didn't know how to explain this concept of the Trinity because the Trinity is God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost and it's hard for a lot of people who who worship sun and worship fire, worship air, to think of this concept, okay, you have one person, but it's three different beings all at once. How can this be? So he used a shamrock to teach it because the shamrock has the three leaves, and so the Father would be up top, the Holy Spirit, and the Son is still the same person because the shamrock is still one entity, but it has three different parts to it because people would try to use things such as water to explain um, the Trinity. In water, you have the liquid, the vapor, and the solid form. However, that is considered um, modalism by the church because it's saying that it's all the same thing because you can change water from one form to another form very easily. However, God isn't like that. He's not three different, he doesn't appear to be in three different forms. He just is three forms. And so that was considered heresy, and so he tried to come up with a way to teach it and found an effective way. Um, and he also used the shamrock not just because it was easy as a visual aid, but it, the shamrock also was very into the um, Druid population, which were the native people of Ireland. 
they kind of worshipped it in a way because it had because it was the number three, and just like in Christianity, there's special numbers like three and well, like seven and stuff, and we have three. Um, the Druid population had a big association with the number three, and so that was like, oh hey, you know what? This isn't pagan. This isn't horrible. This is actually good. The next teaching that he used was the snakes. It supposedly said that um, he drove all the snakes out of Ireland. There are no snakes to be found in Ireland to this day. There were never, and we haven't found, there haven't been any fossil records found of snakes in the area. Um, the legend states that when he was fasting up on a mountain for the Lenten period, for the 40 days, a snake bit him. And so he drove it out and drove all the other snakes into the ocean because it hurt him. But um, since there are no fossil records found to prove that there ever was any snakes, um, it is said that that's just an allegory, well not allegory, but a story to say, oh, he drove out paganism and drove everything out of Ireland. And the snakes were also a um, druid, kind of druid story that went along with it. So they were like, oh, he did drive out all the snakes being the druids. And because um, the snakes had to do a certain symbolism. Okay. So there is a cathedral in Dublin, Ireland that's dedicated to this man because he w impacted the area so much. Um, the cathedral was founded in 1191, which was about 700 years after he died. It's built in the Gothic style and it's the, of the Roman Catholic Church, which, excuse me, which is now the Church of Ireland, and it's the largest cathedral in the nation. Um, it was built near a holy well that they believe is where St. Patrick used to baptize people because he said in his confessio in this town there are these rocks, and one of them was a well, and so they found four rocks next to where they built this church, and um, the other ones had body parts in it, so it would be a grave. And this fourth one has what it looked like used to be a spring down at the bottom because it's this very deep hole. So they believe that was the well that he used to baptize people. So they said, what better place to put a cathedral that's dedicated for him next to where he used to teach. Um, there's a bunch of people who are buried <coughs> in the cathedral. Six to seven hundred people are um, buried in there. They include nobility and clergy and very famous people all the people that um, used to be in charge of the church at one time. They're either in the walls, you can see different um, little boxes that have them in them, or on the floors, there's a bunch of people buried in there. Some famous people that are buried in there is Jonathan Swift, who everyone's read him for English 101, and his, also, his companion, Stella. And so he, and Jonathan Swift used to be in charge of the church. He used to be one of the archbishops up there. So that's why he's very there. <coughs> um, St. Patrick's Cathedral has a school inside of it and a choir. Um, the school is known as St. Patrick's Grammar School, and it's a secondary education. It used to just be for boys. And then now they've started opening up a little sector of it to girls, but there's not many girls there. Um, and then from that school, boys are offered to go to the choir school where they practice, they go to their regular schooling for only a few hours a day and then they go and sing for the rest of the day. Um, the choir school is very famous. It was founded in 1432 and it's the only um, one in Ireland. And from the school, the boys are chosen to go to the choir if you want to and you're paid. And then you also get a discount on education, we used to, but in 1998 they got rid of that part of the deal, and they're given free music lessons. Um, girls were started to be admitted to the choir in 2000, but however they're still unpaid, and the boys still get payment for their services. And an interesting fact about the choir was that it was the first choir to sing Handel's Messiah on April 13, 1742. So it was interesting that someone from another nation who is this big, huge composer, and the Messiah is one of the most well-known pieces that he wrote to choose the Irish um, school, Irish choir to use that. And I have a picture of sorry, do you do 
it, when you work on it in 13 and then you come here and have it in 2007, it really messes you up. Um, but above is a picture of the cathedral, and then there's the boys' school, boys' choir. It was going through. And then an organ is the is one of the biggest parts of the cathedral besides the school and the choir. It's the largest known organ in Ireland, and it has over 4,000 pipes. Some of the pieces date back to 1695 from the original organ, which was the Rednes Harris organ. However, it's had to be revised and cleaned, and parts have broken, so it's been changed a few times. In 1980, they rebuilt it. Um, Henry Wills and Son rebuilt, that was the company that rebuilt it, and Sir George Martin oversaw it, and some of the parts are still there today. And then in 1963, they had to restore it again by J.W. Walker and Sons. And I have a virtual tour of the cathedral. It's really awesome. Here's the nave. I'm trying to see if I can get bigger. Nave of the church. And it gives you a full 360 degree area to see it. You can also go up and down, and that's what we'll be going later. I think it's really beautiful. And then... Is that carpet? No, it's just tile. Mosaic tile. I didn't think Shirley was carpet, but yeah. Mm -hmm. like and this is um, where the choir usually performs, in that box area. Did you find anything where the choir be performing? You have I didn't know while we're there, since so we'll be there on the weekend? Yeah. It's, it, they have over... 20 services a day, but it doesn't sure. say when the choir is going to be there. And then here's the Lady Chapel. So they have a little section out. It's really pretty. So the tradition of St. Patrick's Day is when uh, everyone decides to be Irish. Everyone decides to celebrate this man who changed the nation. A traditional um, St. Patrick's Day started in medieval times. Soon after he was not far off of when he was um, dead that they started saying, hey, this guy changed our nation, we'll celebrate him. And it was very special because people got to close up their shops and they went to church in the morning and then they had this big feast at night. Um, the feast is to pay homage and celebrate the patron saint of Ireland. Uh, and the tra traditional meal is boiled bacon and cabbage. And so I thought that was interesting because today we have our traditional meal is the corned beef and the cabbage, or the uh, sauerkraut, which is a pickled version of cabbage. Um, however, that wasn't what they used to eat. And there was also the tradition of starting to wear green back in the medieval times. However, it wasn't like a green shirt or green pants or green face paint or whatever. It started out to be just wearing a shamrock, shamrock on your lapel wearing it for the whole day and then taking it off later. Um, however, in, it started to change throughout the centuries and when people moved from Ireland to the U.S. In the 18th century was the first St. Patrick's Day parade. It was when some Irish soldiers who were fighting with the British against us um, traveled from one street to another in lower Manhattan to a tavern to celebrate the day and they were wearing their shamrocks. And then uh, that's how the idea got started to let's have a parade to celebrate this because they marched from one area to another. Um, however, they still didn't wear the greens. They were just wearing the lapel camera. Um, in the 19th century is when the traditional St. Patrick's Day really got overturned because there was a mass migration from the potato famine that we've heard about from of Irish to the U.S. And so they um, still wanted to show celebrate their traditions and keep it the same so they couldn't find many shamrocks here because they don't grow here. And so they used to start it, uh, start the tradition of wearing of the greens, where they would get a green coat or a green petticoat or something and start wearing it here. Um, and it was important, the reason why they kept their traditions here, it was important for them to say, we're here to stay because a lot of people went to higher Irish, higher Irish people during that time that they came over and had the mass migration and they would literally put out doors outside their businesses saying, um, no Irish need apply, 
not many people, they had to go into ghettos, no one really liked them, and so they were saying, you know what, we're going to stay here, and that's when they started to do the big parades. Um, now we have the modern day St. Patrick's Day, which is um, celebrated more so in the U.S. than it is actually in Ireland. Um, there's the longest and biggest parade, which is in New York City, which is on the same street that the tavern was on, on Lower Manhattan, but it um, obviously has increased in miles due to all the people. Um, it's most, one of the most traditional parades that we have in the U.S. because it includes soldiers, um, groups such as Irish groups, and wolfhounds lead the parade, and that's what always would. And however, versus like the Thanksgiving Day Parade, we have tons of balloons and it changes every year and it's more about like entertainment, which is more about celebrating Irish culture. Um, it, became, it started to become bigger and better with um, John F. Kennedy being elected to the Senate and then becoming our president because he was of Irish um, background and it was, uh, the Irish people were like, oh, we're finally gaining importance in this uh, nation. And so a lot of people became nationalistic when he um, there's also a parade in Ireland, which is, um, they have a, kind of a separate one, which is more modern, like our times, and they have a more traditional um, type of, you close up shop, you go to church in the morning, you feast at night. However, um, this is also when, in Ireland and in the U.S., when it started to become more popular, that the food changed from the boiled bacon and the cabbage to the corned beef and the cabbage, because the corned beef is... Um, a very inexpensive meat um, piece of meat that you um, cook that you let sit in this like beer it's not beer but it's a uh, type of alcohol and it brines for a while and then you can cook it so it was more expensive to buy bacon here than it was to buy corned beef and so they were like oh we'll just get corn and the cabbage because they also had the, the mindset of um, if someone can smell the meat then you'll be charged more taxes which is how it was in Ireland and when you cook cabbage it has a really awful smell so they kept that to not have to pay taxes but you're not based on taxes now you can buy meat or not <laughs> that's it
because we did a lot of our biology presentations in Fresno this past year, just because, um, or not this past year, the year before last, because PB was just trying it out to see if this worked better, because the maps and the, like, we were having trouble making it all work. So she was like, well, this is going to be the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. You get a file, so All right. Well, hello. I'm Olivia. And I want to talk about Trinity College and the Book of Kells. And like a couple of people have noted on the like Trinity College in a few of their uh, presentations already. And I think that shows a lot of precedence because Trinity College is known like nationally and like known like around the world. It's a really nice facility and a really nice college. And they have different like satellite schools, but this is like. College. This picture right here is of. Sorry. I wanted to use the board, but I haven't. I'm not like really familiar with like touching it. This is like the front square. Of See the what happens if you touch the picture. Fine. Touch the picture if you want. I mean, perfect. Just stretch it. Okay. So this is the front square. Make it interactive. <laughs> uh, this is the front square of the school, and like there are several different. Uh, Pictures from. Um, oh my gosh! Now I don't know how to make it smaller. <laughs> um, um, from the college, and I used the ones that were the prettiest. And I mean, they had several different pictures of this entrance right here. And this is like the main entrance. But over here is like if you're like looking down on it. And this is the front square right here. That picture I just showed you. This little. This is. The Botany Bay is right here, and then these two pictures over here are of the old library, which has, I think Hunter talked about the old library is where the harp, the oldest harp uh, is like stored, and the old library is like a museum in itself, and like it's also functioning as a library to the students at the college. And then right here is the mission, mission statement for the school. And it says, Trinity College builds on its 400-year-old tradition of scholarships to confirm its position as one of the great universities of the world. And just to go off of that, um, in Times Higher Education World University Rankings for 2013, Trinity is ranked 129th out of 200 world universities. And then for World, like in world university rankings, it's the 61st out of 100. So it's pretty prestigious. Um, it was founded in 1950, or no, 1592. And it currently has 1,600, no, 16,860 registered, registered students in 2011 and 2012. And the alumni that they currently have is 97,277. And then research income alone, they have $65.2 million. So I thought that was that. So that's Trinity College. And I'm, I'm guessing we're doing a walking tour of this. It's very large, if you can't tell from this picture. It's very pretty. like what we would have and then they have like at night they have like all these skits 
and like things that they like perform for the new students that are um, enrolled. And then they don't have like Greek life and like they don't have I think like some of the clubs we do, but the um, the two clubs that I wanted to talk about were um, the Central Society, uh, yeah, Society Committee, and the DUCA, which stands for it doesn't say D, what the DU stands for, but Central Athletic Club, and the Central Society like committee, like they oversee a lot of the other like committees and like other like societies like on campus. So they're like the head honcho, and they um, they're responsible for student organizations in Trinity College. So I think they would be like in comparison to here, like sure. yeah, SGA, pretty much yes. Good. Um, their athletic club ranges from, like, it has 50 sports clubs. And let me see, I pulled up on here. Oh, man, I didn't pull up the right one. Like, they have, um, the sports range from, like, badminton to windsurfing. They have, like, taekwondo. They have rowing. They have hurling. They have the gay leg football. They have everything. And ultimate frisbee. Like anything you can get involved, they have it. And I thought that was really, like equestrian. I think this picture, see there's Gaelic football. And this, I wanted to say it was handball. They have hit me. We played in middle school and it was a big deal. Um, but I thought it was really interesting because a lot of the sports that we don't really take into account, like I think that we have here in America, like in the States, they like, This is the old library, and I looked up a few facts about this, which was really interesting. The first one was the original building was designed by Thomas Berg, and then it was like took over, I think, 30 years to construct. And the you're gonna think up here. The Star Wars movie, The Attack of the Clones, used this library as inspiration to um, make their Jedi archives. I don't know if y'all watched the movies, but like the, there's a part where um, Obi Wan Kenobi goes and talks to like Yoda in the the archives, and it looks similar to this, but they didn't um, use like they there was like a lawsuit about it because the library didn't want uh, I can't remember the director of Star Wars' his name, but they didn't like use like legal rights or something, but uh, Trinity College dropped charges of it. Uh, the long room holds one of the last remaining copies of the 1916 Proclamation of the Irish Republic. And the library dates back to the establishment of the college in 1592, and it's the largest library in Ireland. Today it has 5 million printed volumes with extensive collections of journals, manuscripts, maps, and music reflecting over 400 years of academic development. And it's also most famous for the Book of Kells, the like exhibition of the books, Book of Kells and the Book of Jerome. But I didn't do the Book of Jerome, I did the Book of Kells. And these were some of like the current and forthcoming exhibitions. Not exhibitions. Okay. And the Book of Kells, of course, the In Tune Millennium of Music, and the Dorothy Price exhibit. Um, what the Millennium Music is about, it has like five different themes, and it holds like it talks about the early music treasures, the music in the 18th century, Irish folk music, collection of expansion, and modern Irish masters. These two ex uh, exhibits won't be there while we're there, but I thought it'd just be cool to talk about because they have interesting uh, facts. Um, the Dorothy Price exhibit sounded really um, interesting. She devoted. She's also an alumni of Trinity College, and she developed her master's thesis about children with tuberculosis and kind of solving poverty for children. Um, and it, she did a lot of her study and her work at St. Alton's Hospital. And this is Dorothy right here. And this is the Millennium Music. And we're going to talk about the Um. 
Can you all see that? The book, it says, the Book of Kells has been on display at the old library at Trinity College for 300 years and attracts over 500, half a million visitors a year. So we're going to be a part of that. This is the Book of Kells. These are just set like a couple pictures of the book, and I'm going to talk to you all about that. The book first arrived at Trinity College in 1661 and has not left since. So it's, it's been here, it lives here, and I don't think it's moving anytime soon. They do a lot of the restoration, I think, at the college, and this is it's, it's home. It has been estimated that the book was constructed over by several authors and took about 30 years to complete. And then, like, they have gone through it, like, every page, and they took, like, a magnifying glass to each picture, and all of the lines and all of, like, the coloring was done only once. Like, they, there's no fault, like, flaws, there's no faults, it's just all hand done, which I thought was really interesting. Here, we'll go to another picture and see the other one. Because when they get into some of like this, all hand up. Which I, I just, it blew me away. And, and it also, they also thought like since it, this looks so beautiful and it's so perfect, they thought only angels could have made it. And the book is celebrated for its lavish designs. And the manuscript contains the first four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they were all written on like caps animals like leather. The book is considered to be one of the crowning glories of the Celtic art form. The book contains thousands of pages of text and images all handwritten. The cover is no longer with the book because it was ripped off when it was like bringing a long time ago when they were trying to figure out like the origin like where it came from. On its way I think to Trinity College it got the cover got ripped off because it had really like giant gems on the front of the cover and like gold and so people thought they had to have it so they ripped it off. So it was and, still. Mm -hmm. and so because of that, I think also the first 30 pages all had water damage. So those weren't able to be like restored, unfortunately. So like, the, I guess the thir first 30 pages are like Matthew, which is the first. Um, only two volumes are on display. One is open to a major decorated page and the other is open to a page of script. And the volumes are changed out in intervals so they're not always displaying the same, um, uh, like, same thing every time. And then there is like some controversy of like where it came from. But what I found was the place of origin of the Book of Kells is generally attributed to the monastery found on Iona, an island off the west coast of Scotland. It has most been, it's like close to like the year 18 or 800 that the Book of Kells was written, although there is no way of knowing the book was pro like produced wholly at Iona or at Kells. So it's either one of those locations they've narrowed it down to. Oh wait, hold on, sorry, I pulled this up for a reason. I I tried working at this like over the break on like trying to get the virtual tour to to work and it like for see, a lot of the times it doesn't work. And it's saying quick time player any information to run. Well, we'll just click on like the different pictures to see that. See, I try to make it work. So like over here are all the pictures of like all the different places that I'm sure we will walk to and see. I'm sorry, I thought it would work. But let's see if we can find Okay, this is like their clubs and their societies. And this is the athletic club I was talking about. And then over here is all their sports clubs. So let's see. You have American football, basketball, boat, boat ladies, boxing, I don't know what that is. cricket, crochet, cycling, fencing, kayaking, karate, judo, curling, triathlon, volleyball, sub aqua. So, 
all these sports are available at Trinity College. And their website is really nicely done, in my opinion. It made it very easy for like tourists and visitors to like come over here and like know what's going on at their college. Any questions? They call their club athletic club. Are they like ours? Are they compete against other colleges, or is it more like our? I think it's club, like like a club. So it's and, just for fun. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's like a fee you pay to be like like in the club. And because I know certain colleges here, you, uh, for a club team, you pay to have your equipment and you pay to like go places. I'm sure it might be the same over there. I'm not 100% sure, but that's my understanding of the club. I, I've noticed um, in my reading, and y'all who kind of look at this course, which I don't know if I have this correct, but my understanding is there aren't any professional teams in either country that it's, it's all pride of play, like you represent your town or something, and nobody gets paid. It's just like the pride of being a part of the team and things like that. And it's very, very popular. I mean, sport talk popular, but it's it's not it's not like ours where you have professional people that are paid and that's what they do. It's not like that. That's, that's what I've read in. So, I did, I figured out how far LaGrange was from Edinburgh. Edinburgh. It's 4,059 miles. Uh, LaGrange is 29.5 square miles, and Edinburgh is 101.9 square miles. And then this map just shows you the distance. And the water of is the main river running through Edinburgh. The river is 22 miles long. city in Scotland, the seventh largest in the United Kingdom with a population of about 475,000 people. The city is located on the southeast side of Scotland. It occupies the northern third of the island of Great Britain. The elevation of Edinburgh is a 135 feet above it's above sea level. And then it said like how Rome is built on a couple hills. It said that Edinburgh is built on seven hills. Uh, it's Castle Rock, Calton Hill, Arthur's Seat. It's right in the center. Um, course. Blackford Hill, Braid, and Western Craiglock Park. And then this just shows you where each one is located in the area. This is Arthur's Seat. This one's Castle Rock. This is Blackford Hill. This one's Compton Hill. Braid Hill. And Western Craiglock Hill and and then in May it's it is sunny approximately 36 percent of daylight hours and cloudy 63 percent of daylight hours in May the average daily temperature is 8.5 degrees Celsius which is 15.3 degrees Fahrenheit the weather in May is slightly dry with rain every now and then. The average high temperature in Edinburgh reaches 14.2 degrees Celsius, which is 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And the average temperature is cool at 99.9 .9 degrees Celsius, which is 49.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And overnight temperature cool the temperature cools down with an average of 5.7 degrees Celsius, 
which is 42. And this is, shows the, the red one is the average high temperature. Um, I guess it's the dark purple shows the average temperature. And the blue is the average low temperature. The yellow one is the average sunlight hours during the day. Um, the orange dotted line, I don't know what that one is. The magenta one is hours of daylight. The green is precipitation. And the black is the relative humidity. And this is during May. And daylight, the shortest day is 15 hours long, and the longest day is 17 hours long, with an average of 16. The mean of the sunlight hours is 5 hours, the percent. And this shows the, the average number of daylight hours per month, and this is where we'll be. And then the amount of rainfall. Edinburgh has a marine west coast climate that is mild with no dry season and warm summers. Average precipitation is 26.3 inches per year and 55.7 millimeters per month. The wettest weather is in September and the driest weather is in April. Average rainfall in May is two inches. The most rainy days in May is 14 or 45 percent. And then this is the average snowfall. December and January are the coldest months of the year. The average temperature is only 45 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, and at night temperatures can drop to about 34 degrees. Average days of, of lying snow is 50. Uh, most likely month for snow to fall is in January, but most likely to fall in spans of the month is November. Okay, that, that gave us some really good information there. Um, we should have... I've got a couple YouTube things and stuff to show you guys, so... So this is... National hands up. This was at a soccer game. Do you mind if I call it football? Because we call it football. No, no. It's football for the, the rest of the um, Is there going to be sound in this? There oh. should be. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is called Flower of Scotland. And uh, this is like the English translation, and then this is like the 
old Scottish writing of it, and then this is the Caliph. So I'll let you quickly read over that so you can have a little idea of it. It was pretty much written, I think it was written about the, the Battle of Bannockburn. Has anyone seen uh, Braveheart? Yeah. It was, um, it was like, for the example of the lyrics, uh, uh, and stood against them, proud of his army, and sent them homewards. Like, yeah. That was pretty much loosely based, what uh, Braveheart was based on, the Battle of Bannockburn. And so, it's pretty much about dislike. Towards and it's kind of like I mentioned, like, as far as talking about the battles that mm -hmm. We're a very so um, patriotic country. In a different way from the Americans, but we are very patriotic. Okay. Back to the pen. country in the world, Scotland, is that um, Coke isn't the best selling product, like for sodas, and this is our juice, it's just a soda, I guess, and you, you can't really describe the taste of it, it's like a very bright orange colour, but it's not like an orange flavour, it just tastes like, it's hard to describe, but you'll have to have someone you're there, honestly, that's take a note of that iron brew, because you got it, okay, because, but what does it taste, you don't have it. Everyone, I 
again, everyone usually likes it, I just don't really like it for some reason. So what does it taste like? <laughs> tastes like... It's hard to describe this thing. Like, I'm not very good at describing it. I've not noticed already. Um, Does it taste like chicken? No, it's not like chicken. It's like... Like a sausage? Kind of, like, kind of like a sausage, kind of. It's more like sausage than chicken, anyway. But I would, also, I would suggest... You can also get that in the, in the chippy, in the chip shop. You can get like, that deep fried as well. Because um, I don't think you're going to get a chance to really have it. Um, like in a restaurant or anything, I don't know if you're just going to sit down and ask for a haggis. So, if you have it, you may be probably the easiest getting it from a chip, chip shop. Um, but I don't know, quite a lot of people like it. And I think the next one's actually Robert Burns, uh, like the like Scotland's national night, night where we eat the haggis. So, I might need to try and get my hands on it. Um, okay, whiskey. Whiskey is like a big important part, part of Scotland. It's the one in, it's the top five exports in the whole of the UK, um, like the amount of money they make of it, so it's really a big part of Scotland. And you can go through like many, there's a lot of like different tastings and like uh, you can view the distilleries and stuff like that, and that's pretty interesting. I know like quite a lot of people have enjoyed it that. There's hundreds all over Scotland, so if that is something you'd be interested in, then just easy Google search, you'd be able to find it. Um, uh, yeah, I think they get about 800 million pounds a year just from whiskey and exports, so it's a lot of money. I'm going to get more into like sightseeing place in a second, but this is all just like no, a basic. Okay. Whatever you need to tell us. Okay, uh, so the history. Um, so Scotland's very old, it's much older than America is. Um, groups of settlers first um, started building houses that were around 9,500 years ago. Um, first villages around 6,000 years ago, and then Scotland as we know it started in 800, the year 843, so a long, long time ago. Um, we gained independence from England in 1314, and that's what this is, a picture of a drawing of the Battle of Bannockburn, um, which happened. And I've actually not got that on the slides, um, this place that you can go, but and it's actually pretty easy to get to, pretty close to where this battle happened. It's in a place called Stirling, which is around 30 miles away from Edinburgh, I think it is. And that's pretty cool because you can actually go to like, the war of the battlefield and you can go to Stirling Castle and there's a museum and stuff like that. Um, and in the Battle of Annie which is what Braveheart was based on, around five to 10,000 Scottish people defeated. Um, around 14,000 to 25,000 was an uh, estimate. English people, so we, we did well, and that was a famous battle. Excellent. Okay, religion in Scotland. Um, so Scotland, we're pretty much mostly, uh, it's mostly Protestant from the Church of Scotland, nearly like 50%, I think it is, and then also parts like Roman Catholic, and the rest was just other denominations, and you don't really know all this, so I don't want to keep it then. <laughs> um, Sports, we like football. This is two of like, the biggest games in Scotland and it always gets very aggressive. Um, and I don't know if there'll be any games that will be on in May when you're there, but if there is, then it may be a good idea to see one because it's a totally different like, atmosphere in the games than it is in, in America. So I don't know if you'd be interested. Yes, we, we are, but I don't, we've already looked. We don't think there's yeah, any yeah. games. So I'll be there. Well, there um, we did want to know, we were just having a discussion before you got here. From my reading, it looks like there are no professional teams yeah. there, that it's like community well, or village is. teams. As in like... It, yeah, like no paid so. athletes? Oh, no, no, there is. There are? Yeah, okay. yeah. Like, for example, this game here, it's like the second biggest derby. Do you know the word derby? Like, rivalry match in like the world of football. So it's like, it's like the, the second best and the one best, like biggest one and stuff. So they get like 67, 70,000 people in the game. So, and then this one's like one of the biggest in Britain as well. That's my team there. Um, and there's not as many fans for that, but yeah, they're all, the top two leagues are all professional leagues and stuff. So. Um, but there may be a rugby game on. And Scotland is pretty big in rugby as well. Probably around, I think we're about 10th best in the world right now. We're not as good as we used to be, um, but so we're pretty good. And there's often summer tests that are on, so there could be summer games on and the national team stadium was in um, within my city so it's 
so and it's in Edinburgh, so it could be an easy thing to go to. And it's usually not very expensive. And you get to, for all your ladies, you get to watch big, strong men fight each other. So. <laughs> Okay. Other sports. Do we have that on our list? To watch big strong men fight each other? I think so. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. Uh, okay. Uh, other sports. We we don't play like American football really. We're starting, but it's never. There's nothing like you get paid for it. So we pretty much have like the random sports that not many people care about, like tennis. It's Andy Murray and Colin Montgomery, the golfer. Even your head. Curling. I think we were the champions of curling for like we're one of the best us in Canada, I think uh, two of the best teams. Gary Anderson, the darts player, so like, really good sport. That's why Scottish people like it because you get to drink whilst you whilst you play it. So um, Chris Hoy is one is I think the best UK uh, Olympian ever. What is sport? Uh, cycling. He's like a short distance cycling, like sprint cycling and stuff. Um, he's won a lot of Thanks. Stephen Hendry, he was world champion in snooker. Snooker? Um, yeah. Snooker. Is that the same pool? It's kind of pool, but like, say, a, okay, say like, snooker table, oh, say a pool table is this big, the snooker table would be like, this big. It's huge. Oh. It's like much bigger and wider, and it's, like, there's red balls, you have to put a red ball, and then you put a coloured ball, and you just see how high you can get your score, pretty much. It's different, but it's much harder and stuff. And this is an interesting one. I thought this was funny when I found this out. We were actually the world champions at um, elephant polo. So, <laughs> no elephants in Scotland, so I don't know how that happened, but that was, that was fun to find out. So that was in 2006. I don't know if we've been champions since then, but I just tell people why I'm, because it's very funny to, to say that. Okay, now this is getting on to the more places to go visit. Oh, quite a few of these will actually be in Edinburgh, um, because that's obviously the one I know most about. And um, I'm not excited like, anything, so don't tell anyone. But uh, this website, Real Edinburgh, uh, sorry, Facebook page, and they've got a lot of um, good photos of Edinburgh. So I could, you know, pretty much show you like all the photos. But I'm not going to start wasting my time. But so much time. But if you just go on their Facebook page, Real Edinburgh, you'll see a lot of nice pictures of Edinburgh. Um, where is this? Okay, this is on Cotton Hill. This is um, in the city centre. Like behind where this photo was taken, like if you're standing with the photographer, if you turn around, you'd see like the whole city of Edinburgh. Um, and there's a couple different monuments on this hill. Uh, this one is called, um, what's this one called? Uh, the National Monument, and it was built in in 1826. Well, it started getting built in 1826, and it was finished um, in 1829. But it was actually left unfinished because of lack of funds. So if you see at the back here. There's no pillars around the back because we didn't have enough money. And like I think anyone else in the world would have went and finished it a few years later and we kind of thought about it on numerous occasions, but we just left it. Um, I don't know if that's laziness or if it's because we think it's cool, or I don't know, but um, it's actually nicknamed Scotland's Disgrace and Edinburgh's Disgrace because of you know, we couldn't finish it, but I think we sort of have you know taken it on and thought it was a yeah, funny thing. So that's a uh, it's a very cool place to go. And with that as well, you get to see a good um, sight of the old Edinburgh, very much so. It's a nice place to go. Um, this is a picture facing the other way. And this is another monument. It's a Dougal Stewart monument. He's not very famous. He's a philosopher who died in the 1700s or 1800s, I think it was early. This was built in 1831. It's just a, a monument. And again, that's a view that you see if you were on Cotton Hill. That's really beautiful. This is Edinburgh Castle. Okay, um, it's been here since the 12th century, and you can't really see it. But there's another picture in the second, so that's fine. Okay, um, and it was pretty much built as like a fortress. So anyone trying to attack us, we could just shoot them off the hill and, you know, or whatever they used back in the day. But it was really good strongholds and stuff for all the battles we had in the past. And now it's like a it's a very nice place to go and visit, and um, there's a lot of like events that get held at like the Fringe in the summer, which is like a military like show. It's always there, and again you get a good view. I've got a YouTube video here actually of the view from Edinburgh Castle, and it's, it's really nice. Um, and what else? 
Uh, if you're in Edinburgh at one o'clock, there's the thing called the one o'clock gun, which is a pretty much a big cannon, and they fire it off every day at one o'clock. And that's like weird if you don't know what's going on, and like if you don't know about it, and you're walking through the city of Edinburgh at the time, you just hear a big bang, and you're just like, no. But it's, it's just, uh, it's like, no, it's not real, real at the it's just like, no. And this is a video, it's actually another famous Scottish guy called Danny McCaskill, and he's a cyclist, like a um, stunt, a trial biker or something. Um, the, the and I thought I'd think this is a really cool video about the car. Just, we're going to see it the first time. It's like, <coughs> it has a castle in the background. It's a main street. The I think it's crazy how he got the chance to actually cycle around Edinburgh Castle because like, it's a really historic monument and he's just cycling around it and then he's doing this. You can see in a second. And then you can see in the background, that's the city of Edinburgh there in the background. So that's a view of the when you get to the top of Edinburgh Castle. Tenement buildings very close together, and 
in the 18th century, actually, Edinburgh was one of the dirtiest and most densely populated and overcrowded towns in the whole of Europe. Um, and that's kind of partly due to the fact that there was like no plumbing and stuff, so when people were to the toilet, they felt like the buckets, and they would go to their windows and they would just shout, guard the loo, just friend, a French word, but it's pretty much the warning that they're going to throw buckets of extra all over you. So if you hear that, then you just have to run because you wouldn't want to look up because there would be stuff going on. And yeah, it was pretty bad living conditions back then, but it's better now. It's a nice town. <laughs> so um, you talked about the bottles before. Oh, just a little bit. Um, so they were completed in 1788. Um, they're there to uh, house taverns, cobblers, and other tradesmen. But and sometimes there's there are also storage places for like illicit material, like, illicit things that happen. For example, like the bodies of um, Burke and Earth, They think they went they went there to like find their victims and also like kept in there and stuff like that. Have you talked about Burke and Earth? The Burke and Earth? Somebody did. The murders, the serial murders. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, a lot of people left, all the people who had their business in their life because of such bad conditions and stuff, and then Edinburgh's old, like, their poorest people who moved in there, like, not legally, but they kind of became, like, the slums uh, in Edinburgh back in, like, the 1800s. Um, and it was only discovered, actually, that in 1985 that they had people living in there when they found things like toys and medicine and bottles and plates and stuff in there. Um, I have another picture, so. And I've actually been in these things, and they, they are really like, creepy. But I would say you have to go visit them because I don't know, it's just totally different. In daylight? Yeah, at night time, always at night. No. Yes. Well, <laughs> you have to go. On, okay, this is another thing I'm going to talk about in a second. But the ghost stories are must. They're really scary. But I've got like the ghost people. Like they're really funny. Like the tour guides are actually really funny. So they'll like tell you little spooky jokes and stuff, and then they'll be like, they'll, they'll tell jokes, and yeah, it's, it's really good fun. And they always start at night time, so you can't go during the day, so you have to, have to face your fears. Um, <laughs> um, okay, that's all I've got in box right now. But, okay, great far as Bobby, have you heard about this guy? Dog. No? Okay, Great Fire Bobby. He was a dog who there's a statue for him pretty much because for was it fourteen years? Yeah, fourteen years after his owner died he sat beside his owner's grave and like didn't leave. Um, and the grave is in the cemetery around the corner from here. It's actually just like around here, right here in the cemetery. Um, and but the most like the best thing I think about the, the graveyard is called Greyfriars Kirkyard and that is one of the more haunted places in Edinburgh and there's ghost tours that do here and also the vaults I think so you should do one of these but the only thing is with this ghost tour it's pretty intense because people actually like come out of it with like marks in their bodies and stuff like that so like um, what was I saying uh, like between 1990 and 2006, there's 350 reported attacks from like extraterrestrial stuff, and 170 reports of people collapsing as well in the place. So, <laughs> I, I got I got closed down. People weren't allowed to go into it. And after people they were getting like cut, bitten, scratched, and like blacking out and stuff in the place, um, and uh, most of the things were um, near a what's it called like a mausoleum in, in the uh, cemetery where something bad happened and so they shut it down and in 2000 there was an exorcist there and they found the evil forces and stuff. The vaults are starting to look good <laughs> compared to the um, And then pretty much, I don't know, there's a website up, it's called the City of, De uh, City of the Dead Tours. Have you seen those ones? The City of the Dead Tours? Okay. Yeah, so that's the that's the one that the they they do on. they do the balls and they do this one as well. But I've not actually been on this one yet. I've been on the other one. I just never got around. But it's only like ten pounds, which is like fifteen dollars. So and nothing really happens anymore. It's pretty safe because I don't think they would let me open if it wasn't safe. But I think you should go. And if I'm back home at night, I'm back home with you. You can hold my hand. Elephant house, anyone heard of this one? Okay. 
you like Harry Potter? I know. Yeah? You look like you farted this one. No, she just likes elephants. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the right or Harry Potter test is right on Harry Potter. Hands up. Hands up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was asking the doctor. Oh, she got it right, so well done. You get it. Not for me, that's what I'm having. Um, so this is the elephant house. This is what actually she wrote, Harry Potter. So it's like the bar, it's called the Bar's Place of Harry Potter. So if you want to go, this is in the city centre, and this thing here says Bar's Place of Harry Potter, and she sat there and very much wrote, I think, most of the first book there. Um, and I'm not actually sure if she's from Edinburgh, but she lived in Edinburgh a lot of the time. And her house actually was around the corner from where I live, so I could like walk to her house. It's a big, massive house, it's pretty cool. But yeah, I thought I'd add that there. Is it like a restaurant? Uh, it's a cafe, cafe, yeah, pretty much cafe. It's, I don't, I've never been to it actually. I know where it is, um, but I've never been to it. Next one. Yeah. Have you seen this, anyone? No? Okay, these are the bridges, that, this one and this one. This is a rail bridge. Um, this is about a 15 minute bus journey uh, away from the city centre. And it's in a place in South Queen's and it's a very nice like, little village, it's got like, places to eat, it's got a little beach, but a Scottish beach, so it's not a nice beach. So, but it's like a little nice beach, and you can do you can do a lot of things in there, it's a nice place to visit. And this bridge was built in 1890, and this one was built in 1964. And um, pretty much, I think the, the road bridge was, this, when it was built, it was one of like, the biggest in the world, like the fourth biggest in the world. So they're pretty big thing back then, but it's, I don't think it's as big as like the, the Golden Gate Bridge and stuff, but it's still, and it's a pretty good place to go. And also, What's the name of the island? It's, it's an island you're going to? Oh, uh, no, no, the other side is just, uh, I don't know. You don't, you don't have to look at the name of it. No, no, I'll just show you right on the map thing here. Yeah. Okay, so, see here, this is where it is here, between here and here. Oh. So, yeah. You're still on the mainland. Yeah, you're still on the mainland. Um, and also what you can do here, uh, I was just thinking about what else, like if you wanted to go visit this, what else there was to do. There's actually a boat that goes out, um, so into like the estuary, where the, the, bridge, the bridges go over. And it goes to an island called Inchcombe Island, and it's just a little tiny island, and it's got like a, an abbey on it. Um, it's got like a, a, a sort of shop and stuff. It's like a 90 minute tour, I think they do, get, uh, driving out like the three kilometres it takes to get out there. You go visit the island and then you drive back. Um, and it was one of the, it was a home to 500 soldiers, around 500 soldiers during the war, um, both World Wars. And it was like a good place for attack for the German people, but, so that's why we put it, because it was like a yeah, easy place to entry. So it was kind of, it's got like a historical um, part to it as well. And I've been to that once, so it's pretty cool actually, I like that, it was a good day out. Um, St Andrews, anyone like golf in here? Golf is this the university? Uh, this, okay, so this is the golf course here. And the university, I think the university is pretty big, so it connects on quite a lot of the place. But I don't know if it's actually, I don't know, I think this may, might be a part of the university, but I'm not 100% sure. I can tell you for sure. Do we have any golfers in here? My, my uncle and my grandfather lived there, they have a picture yeah. on that bridge. Yeah, that's like, it's really famous, that bridge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's like this, this is the home of golf. This is like the, where golf was invented or, and stuff. So it was, I don't know, it's a pretty interesting place to go to. It's probably about 40 miles north of Edinburgh. Um, but all these ones I'm going to show you from now on are going to be outside of Edinburgh and in like north of Edinburgh or north or west. I have to do that. Yeah, we should be some west. North, west kind of Edinburgh. Um, so if you want to go visit, you can sort of make a trip up and see all these spots. Um, it's a it's a really old town, the home of golf, and it's the third oldest English speaking uni in the world, university in the world. So it's a pretty cool place to visit. Well, the islands, um, I could show you pictures of the islands all day, but we need just... we need some advice on that. We okay. we want to go to Loch Ness only because that's all we've ever heard of is Loch Ness. But our tour company is saying that's too far for a day trip, and so they want to take us. Sort of west instead of north. Is it 
is it much different? I mean, the only reason we wanted to unlock mass is just because of the legend. Uh, well, there's there's Lock Woman, which is west, um, and that's not too far away, and that's like the most famous lock, really, um, and that's one of the biggest, and it's got I've got a slide of hand in it actually, mm -hmm. um, but like. Mostly like all the stuff above like the centre well where all the people live, it's just kind of all like this, so it's you wouldn't have to go to a certain place to see like the certain things, but So it's gonna look the yeah, same. Yeah, it's gonna it pretty much look the same. Yeah. Lot mess. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. But yeah, you can show you pictures of this all day, there's loads of pictures and stuff, but I chose this one. And this is over the west. Yeah, west. Like the west coast um probably about two hours away, maybe three hours away from Edinburgh, I'm not 100% sure. And it's one of the most photographed castles in the world. Um, it's called Elaine Donnan Castle. Even I can't really say that properly. Um, and I just think it's a really nice castle. Uh, I've never actually visited this either. I need to do a lot of these things, but I've never really had a chance to because I didn't drive when I was younger and then I'm in the new university over here now, so yeah, I never had a chance to. But I think it's a really nice castle. And Apart from Edinburgh Castle, maybe Stirling Castle, if there's one other castle you have you want to visit, it would be this one I'd say. Um, okay. Lock Lomond. So Lock Lomond, yeah, that's what this is probably the most famous one in Scotland. I think it's just north of Glasgow, the biggest city. Um, I've never actually been here either because we're gonna take you on. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm gonna come home and just do that actually. Just come along with you guys. I could rent a car and just drive you, I could be a tour guide. Um, but it's a massive block, um, and there's loads of like, little islands on it. It's got the biggest um, freshwater island in the British Isles. It's, I can't remember how big this island was, but it's, it's called Inch Murray, and it's really big. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, there's a lot of islands off of Scotland. I think there's something like 600 islands. And this is another place called Staffa Island. It's round about the same place as the castle I just showed you. Um, you can get a little boat to it. Um, you know, drive up there and get a little boat. It's just a short crossing to get to here. And it's an uninhabited un un island. No one lives there. Um, and it's just, I think, like a lot of the islands are, they're going to be kind of like the same thing. Just a little small island and stuff to do on them and stuff. But this one, you've seen the second as well, they've got, it's just, I think it's really like cool looking island. And there's also a lot of things that off, off, like near here, there's other islands that you can go visit with actually people living on them. So if you're wanting to go visit one of our islands, then that's one of the other things people have to do, see the islands and see the islands as well. So I, know, I think it's really cool, I think, look at that. <laughs> um, yeah. The Island Games. Have you heard about the Island Games? Island Games yeah. They actually, I think they start in May and they go to September. So you might actually get a chance to see them. They, well, where could we see them? That's why they, I can't seem to locate. Yeah, like I, I was actually looking into it recently as well and I couldn't really find it. I think they probably, the details are probably got later. But they go all over the, they all over Scotland. It's not just in one spot, it's like all over like the, the Highlands and, and like little towns all over the place. Um, and I've actually got a video, I don't know if you've watched a video of Caber toss, which is this one on the left, but it's pretty interesting. I don't know why we thought it's a pretty good sport or anything, but we did, and we made this sport. And before anyone asks, I've not got a kill. No, I should not. <laughs> Would you ever see one? Like on the street, someone walking in a kilt nowadays. Not really. Like, it's not. No one wears it just because they want to wear a kilt. They wear it for special occasions, like weddings and stuff like that. <laughs> That's cable tossing. So like, it's it's pretty good. Like, it gets quite a lot of people to watch it and stuff, and they want to wearing kilts like Scottish music and. and I've never had a chance to go to one of these either, but that's very cool. The electric ray, have you heard about this? No? Okay. That's another YouTube video. That's a lot of YouTube games. 
Now this is a, I don't know, it's a road that's uphill, but you roll uphill. And I don't know exactly why, but it's something to do with either it's an optical illusion or there's some kind of like electric force pulling you up the way, but I'll show you a video of it actually in happening. Here we are at the electric brain. Hello, Pete. Hello. Right. Watch this. That there is a hill going upwards. Jamie? He's out of gear. The brakes are off. And we're rolling. Uphill. How does that work? <laughs> they're rolling. They're going. They're leaving me. I need to have gone. But that, that. He isn't actually using any of the advanced sports whatsoever. That is just rolling uphill. That's what allows you to break them. You roll uphill. There's a bit of a stone yes, and you walk out it. Probably got to read it, but the, 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 in fact, I'm going to run it and show them. Apparently it's got a gradient of like 1% or something, and you go uphill. I don't know how it works. There's, I think there's some scientific explanation towards it, but I just prefer to think that it's magical. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, um, that's, where is that? that's also over the West Coast. So like, a lot of these things that we showed you are over the West Coast. Um, I, I think that's a really cool thing to visit. There's other videos, but I have to end. I forgot, I've just got one slide left. And this is for Scottish slang. 50 weird Scottish words. So when you're there, you're going to hear probably some words. I'm going to sort of go through this as 50, so I don't know. I'll just go through it and actually just show you like the ones that get used nowadays. So a lot of these words don't actually get used often. Um, I might have you try and get, say something that I'm actually yeah, I'm very funny. Alright, so when we want to say yes, we say aye. Okay. So, aye. That's, um, I don't know, that's pretty strange. Okay, cool. Next. Bairn, that is child. Child of the bear. I don't know where that comes from, but it is, yeah, not a weird one. Bambot, that's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> They're nice. not planning to use that one. <laughs> <laughs> nice Scottish guy there. Barry. I guess something's really good, yeah, splendid, uh, don't know why, again, that's another really weird one. You're, I'm like kind of thinking, now that I'm showing them to the American people, that it's a really weird one. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. would we be looked at strange if, you know, something really cool happens and you say that's very? <laughs> would they think we were crazy? Probably, well, no, they wouldn't think you're crazy, they're just thinking, yeah. <laughs> 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 they would think, oh, they would think you just go and work. <laughs> Baby. Alcoholic beverage is a baby. Blue Thirst. Very drunk. How do you pronounce that one? Blue I third. better not see that one. Blue Thirst. <laughs> uh, blue Thirst. Blue Thirst. Boggin. That's filthy. I want to hear that. I hope not see that one either. Yeah. Bonnie. That's nice. Like a, bon a Bonnie lass would be a nice girl. Bonnie lass. Cool. Island Coo. Now, do they call these hairy coos? Because that's what the word. That's what we've been seeing. They call highland coos. They're, they're always in the highlands, so highland coos. That sounds bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Kaylee, that's the dance. Okay, that's yeah. pronounced Kaylee? Yeah. Who did? What I did you never have gotten What did you say? How did you pronounce that word? <laughs> I've tried several different ones. I think I said it different every single time, but I think my favorite was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're actually scheduled for a Kaylee dance really? and dinner experience. Oh, okay. oh, now that we know how to pronounce you might, Oh, you might get some haggis there, actually. Yeah, we will. You it's, on, it's on the menu. Okay, you're getting haggis. You all have to get it. I'll be very disappointed if you don't. Know. Um, Clarty. Um, Crabby. Grumpy. Do I? Like, yeah, just you know the people that are just always in uh, they're doing. Don't really use that one. 
Egypt, this is one that we have <laughs> picture of George W. Bush. <laughs> Egypt, that's one. Most like if your granny will call you in Egypt if you do something stupid. Like not like not many young people use it, but like my, my granny used to call me that thing all the time. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a funny picture. Uh, first thing, yeah, it's something just not very nice. Oh, it's first thing. Gadget. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So like are just not nice people. Like what is that word? Bogan. 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 Bogan is. They should not put that word in there. Oh, is that not a good word? No, that's no, it's, that's it's not a bad word. It's just no one will understand it. Bogan is just like another word for like not nice. So, well, gadget. Yeah, don't really use that one. Got lots of idiot words. Yeah. That's the third one. For a very, yeah. No, I don't know why I've got to say that anyway. Greeting. That means crying. Like so, so some people will say like, then they greet, which means don't cry. when you get like your feet cut. So that's why Scotland have that because we're not very good at sports, so we get gumped very often. <laughs> Garn. Yeah, I don't really use that word that often. <laughs> 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 see, I, I, Another word we hope not to <laughs> see, I mean, you might see some some people that are like that in Scotland. But I, I looked at this I've seen this a long time ago well not a long time ago, a couple months ago and I, I looked through it and I loved it. I showed like my trainers at my school. And so I didn't look at it like yesterday, so I didn't know what words was going to be in there. So I remember thinking there was nothing bad. So, do you know? Do you know about America? The trainers at Point University. Out of America. America. You know, yeah, I don't like Matt. Oh, yeah, no, they don't. They don't they're, go there. No. They're right, they're right, so I think there used to be someone there. But, yeah. Yeah, no, we don't use that. Okay, another one for drunk. So we're all drunk in this apartment. That's one we use very often. Haver. Havering is like talking a lot, but that's not really used that often. Poaching, it's like busy. That's um, on New Year's, I think it's a really bad picture, but that's like the Prince's Street, and um, the main street gets filled, um, filled with lots of people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Glasgow, do you know yet? Well, probably. Probably not. Yeah. The Glasgow's are called uh, Ouija's. 
don't know why we call them witches. Does so anyone have a, have a guess what people from Edinburgh are called? Hands up. No? Hands up? Yeah, no, forget oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just Anyway, because like London people are called Londoners and people from New York would be New Yorkers, I guess. So what would Edinburgh be? No, it's not. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually Edin Burgers, as in like a burger. Burger. Yeah, Edin, Edin Burger. Burgers. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm an Edin Burger. And last one, Weesh. Be quiet. So there's a lot of words for be quiet and a lot of words for idiots and a lot of words for being drunk. So yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing. I know. I'm gonna learn that. Weesh. Okay. In case I need it. Yeah. You should be making it. Not quite what you've done, but if you got any questions about scholars. Go ahead and ask me. Okay. What kind of restaurants do you have any that are similar over here? Uh, yeah, we eat like fast food quite a lot of the time, like KFC and stuff. We've got like Italian restaurants, Chinese restaurants. Uh, a lot of Indian food, which we should really get here, like curries and stuff like that. Like, I really like that. And you, I, I've never really seen it in this country since I've been here. But that's another thing that would be very good to eat. Yeah, like yourself a curry. Um, there's a lot of curry houses and stuff, so it's easy to find a place. But it's pretty much the same. Um, yeah, pretty much the same. Our breakfasts are much more savoury than sweet. You know how here you have pancakes with syrup on them and stuff? Ours is like more like, um, just more savoury things, like salty and savoury things. Um, so you'll probably get a chance to get a Scottish breakfast, which is really good. They're like eggs and bacon, and our bacon is different. So you might like it right now. What is it like? It's soft. It's not crispy like it is here. If you got crispy bacon in Scotland, you'd be really disappointed. Because that's well, that's what we'd say. So we get like soft bacon, and it's it's totally different. And um, uh, what else? Yeah. Breakfast. We've been told baked beans never breakfast. Yeah. 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 You also get black pudding, which is have you heard of black pudding? Yeah. 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 I've never really ate that because I just <laughs> like it, but. Um, it's apparently pretty good again, but I just, yeah, another thing I'm kind of scared of. <laughs> um, but apart from that, no, there's not really any like traditional Scottish food, so it's pretty much just all commercialised and foreign food. When you were talking about like all the, um, like the haunted places, have you heard of like a fancy labyrinth club? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's on the wrong now. And that's where, did you look into it at all? Very much, sure. Uh, no, we just like heard stories about it. And, like, so Have you been there? Let me, let me Google it, because there's a lot of pubs in the Royal Mail. Um, it says it's the most haunted pub in Scotland. Yeah, because I, I know there's, I'm just trying to think which one that is, because I know there's two. And, oh, it's on Nidra Street. Oh, okay, that one, okay. <laughs> that's um, just off of the Royal Mail. And, okay, yeah, I think I have been in that one. Yeah, I think I had it like that. Um, but it's, I don't know. It wasn't really, it wasn't really scary to me, but I know exactly where that is. That's just um, I might have met it for something in the presentation. Yeah. Um, it's literally just under five minute walk from the castle, so if you want to go in there and have a non alcoholic beverage. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's another one actually that there was a, actually a cool story about just a bit farther down that road. It's called the the world's end. I don't know if you've ever heard about this one. Um, well, there's well, not the movie. Well, no, not in Canada. In Edinburgh. Okay. Yeah, this one here. Um, and there's like a big uh, thing that battles and barges there back in the day. Um, and it's like a, it's a really like a stock pub and stuff. And yeah, there's been murders there, and there's been like people just go missing from there, and like a lot of real strange things pretty much go, go on there. And, and that's another place you go. I guess there's a lot of like haunted pubs and things like that in Edinburgh, and they're all in the city centre, so they're all nearby each other. So if you want to go visit them, yeah. if if they wanted to visit, just sort of a Locals kind of thing, not a tourist attraction, but they just wanted to go in and see what a normal Irish, I mean, Scottish person might see in a pub. Which one would you recommend? And where is it? Sure, thanks. 
Or you can email me later that puts you on the spot. Because <laughs> there's, in, in Edinburgh there's a, a lot of pubs and if you're in the city centre, oh, you'll be a full of a lot of tourists. Um, but you wouldn't so have get off the Royal Mile, first of all. Yeah, that'd be a good start. And there's a you probably have to just, just go a little bit out of town. But the thing is with Edinburgh, it's not all built up like the likes of Atlanta is and stuff. It's all just small and like kind of close together and stuff. So literally a five minute drive and you'll be totally out of the city centre and you'll just be in the suburbs. So it's pretty good. And it's like there's no like highways or anything, so you can walk it like I would walk home from town and stuff and it's like a 30, 45 minute walk and that's me totally out of the city centre. Um, and you would find pubs around the that area. Uh, I probably have to tell you where to go because a few of them would be not very nice pubs and <laughs> a bit rough. And yeah. but we don't want to make that. Mistake. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I could probably just tell you which areas <laughs> to go to. Well, what you could do there's a place called the Meadows, and that's just the other side. Like you know how if you where you, the view from Edinburgh was, it was like looking this way, obviously from the castle. It's like the other side of that. And it's not far away really, but up there is where, if it's a sunny day, it's where people flock to, to take their tops off and sunbathe and eat and barbecue. And like, it, literally, if you really see the sun, then we're happy. And we just go there and everyone goes there and has a drink and has a barbecue and sunbathe and kicks a bottle of iron and stuff like that. Um, so, I didn't think I was going to have to make that rule, but no topless <laughs> sunbathing. <laughs> I didn't know that was going to be necessary. He probably won. Yeah. There's not a good chance of getting something's gone, I'm sorry. So <laughs> first you get blah blah blah. May it actually might, but because it's not really summer. But our summers are really pretty rainy. Other questions? While we're on the pub topic, um, so you mentioned that there's a lot of people in the pub. Do you know much about the Innocent Gun factory? Innocent Gun? I, I don't know where that is, do you know? I know it's an, it says on the bottle that I have is. It's a Scot. I know it's a Scottish. Edinburgh. Is it Edinburgh? Yeah, that's what it says. Because we had, we had a lot of um, like breweries in Ed in Edinburgh, but quite a lot of them got knocked down, and I'm not sure which ones are still open. <laughs> <Bring it down. laughs> yeah, like I worked opposite one actually. Um, could well there's one. Because the breweries were pretty, pretty cool to them. So there's a very fast story. Friends maybe might have been there. And there's West End, but they were very West End. West End, who was telling us about that yesterday? And it was West End. The one I, where I think it could be, it could be beside the bird that got knocked down where I work. Isn't West End the one that Yeah, yeah. It's not. I don't think it's so far out. 
somebody you can like yeah. Yeah. see it. We have a friend according to the kitchens that married a guy in Scotland, so I think she's kind of open up some of the stuff for Okay. Do you do bird turkeys? You know, it looks kind of upper bird turkeys. <laughs> it's going to be like the Google. Well, they they you can have your pose. picture made in front of it, but... <laughs> well, they offer it in like the And it's a gun? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. I'm fr they sell There's it all. only one place, not even in the grand, so I have to get it. Really? Yeah. yeah I've seen that scene. It's a white point. But yeah, they sell it all over the place. I don't really like it. Do you like it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't really like the hockey beers, but the way that it's made, so what would be like a good local drink to try at the pub? Yeah, are they allowed to drink alcohol? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I'll in moderation. Yeah, I'll in moderation. Okay, this one. This is the best one. Yeah. And actually, you could maybe, their brewery is maybe probably a bit far out. I don't know if they did tours. Uh, it's, in, it's near Glasgow, so you can probably find a little bit of this out. But, um, what did I just do? Where is it? Um, this one. From the can, it's not very good, but um, like a pint of it, is what we drink pints. I get a nice picture of one. And this is like the this is the most popular Scottish drink. And the most popular, though. Yeah. I thought you said the most powerful. I'm like, oh, oh, we don't want oh, that. No. <laughs> so it's like this. That's what it looks like. And this, it's not expensive. It's like for a pint, it's just five hundred sixty milliliters. It's like three pound. Uh, and that's it's just like a lager, like four and a half percent alcohol, and it's really good. That's what everyone in Scotland drinks pretty much. So that's the best local thing, probably, um, that you'd want to drink. There's also like ciders. I don't know if anyone likes cider. Like we don't have any like non-alcoholic cider in Scotland. It's all like alcoholic, and you can get numerous ciders like Bagnish, but they're more Irish, so we probably the better way to get that. Out. Not much other like national drinks. I don't think of bought first, but I wouldn't suggest it. It's not very nice. It's strong wine, and you can see by the people who are drinking it that they probably wouldn't want to drink it. It's, yeah, I would not. Don't don't do that. Just forget about that. Um, yeah. Do you know anything about the Scotch whiskey experience in Edinburgh? It's a it's a place. Yeah, I've never been. Whatever. But. That's a pretty cute, that's like a, I think my friend who's that a few times, he like really likes whiskey. So if you do like whiskey, then that'd be cool. I think you get like a lot of things to taste about a lot of whiskey and stuff there. I'm not really worried about the taste yeah. of it. I think we're supposed to see the process. See that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be, that'd be <laughs> How great. it's made. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure. But it does have a taste at the end. Yeah. 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 You, you would enjoy that. I think that'd be cool to go on for the time, right? Okay, keeping in mind that we have a very limited time in Scotland. And we're going to be based out of Edinburgh. What do you think is the one thing that we got to do to experience the culture of Scotland? One. And if we're already doing it, I'll ask you for your second choice. One thing. You need to drink Iron Brew. You need to go to a chip shop uh, and get lots of fried food. Um, if you could get to a sporting event, a sporting event would be good because we're very like yeah, passionate about our sports, usually, most of the time. Um, so you're not thinking tourists, you're thinking proper like Scotland? Yeah, I was thinking more of like what Scotland's all about, where we can get a real flavor for the culture. Honestly, sitting at a pub one night, just have a few drinks. <laughs> Here. Just listen to what's going yeah, on. Yeah, probably. I don't know. Hard question. Well, you can think about it. I, 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 no, I'll ask. I've got a friend who went to Scotland for like months to study abroad. I'm going to ask them what they thought was their most like, Scottish thing they did. That they like. and I'll come back to you about that. Okay. Because it's hard to think from like an outsider's point of view what you need to do. Yeah, I'm sure we could come up with what we have in here. A hundred things we'd like to do, but we have very limited time. And, and like, so. I, I can, I can yeah. keep on emailing you more and more stuff, yeah. but I just put stuff together. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I know that everybody wants.
wants to know, have you ever seen a snake? Yeah, I've never really seen snakes. <laughs> uh, what we heard today in one of the presentations that there are, or was that ours? I'm confused. I'm fucking busted. You've never seen any snakes there. There is grass snakes every now and then, but there's no dead. There's, there's no dead animals. You're never gonna get killed and there's not enough dead. Like there's no big spiders that are gonna kill you. There's no like scorpions. There's no snakes. There's no snakes. Yeah, 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 no snakes. Yeah, there's no snakes. Yeah, there's no snakes. Yeah, there's no snakes. Yeah, there's no snakes. <laughs> Nothing big. Um, but like, yeah, it's like the biggest animal you'll see is like a deer. And I've only seen like one deer in my life. But here, like when I was in Maine, I saw about a thousand moose, and there's like bears running about the place and stuff. But yeah, it's got to see a deer and like a house fly. And that'll be about it. Maybe I'll, in May you might see like a bee. And you'll, I'll Scottish people would be scared of that, but nothing, nothing else. There's no like venomous spiders or deadly ants or caterpillars, but. So it's very safe. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a, an opposite of view question. As being someone who is not from America, what was the stereotype of America that you heard before you came here, and did you find it to be true? Uh, the stereotype. Usually, you don't have to be nice. I'm not being nice. <laughs> <laughs> You're like fat and fat. Yeah, and <laughs> eat lots of junk food and very uh, ignorant to other people, like, I found that one to be true, and uh, there's, quite <laughs> lot, there's quite a lot of, like, bigger people here than most of the rest of the world, but, like, a lot bigger of people Bigger people meaning overweight people? Yeah, yeah. But there's, like... You guys want to eat all the fried food. Yeah. How does that work? No, I agree with it. It's very overweight. Yeah. I, I agree. We are. No, this but, like, we're not, but... Yeah, like, that, like, they're very, like, a, a lot of Americans don't think much apart from America, you know, like they don't know much about the rest of the world. Like I was saying earlier, they think like England is Scotland, but no one else in the world can think that everyone knows the difference apart from America. Because I guess it's such a big country and if they really believe America, they don't want to. But for me, I, I've travelled all over Europe and like, I've not even been to a lot of countries, I've just been like all over the place. More cultured, I guess, over there than there is over here. And we are trying to combat yeah. that here at LaGrange well, College. Like like because it. it's true. It is true. But but we do have um, we have an immense country, like you say. Mm -hmm. You can tour Europe quicker than you can tour our country. You can. <laughs> and like in Scotland there, well in the UK there's like seventy million I think. And in America there's like what, there's like three hundred million I think it is. And the UK would fit inside like maybe as time. So it's much more, yeah. And then you, you can travel on a two hours and you'd be in England. And then you can travel on like two you know, like another five hours and you're in France and then another couple of hours and you're in Belgium, Netherlands and Germany. So yeah. You're gonna have to be more cultured, you know, because it's over there. Anything else anyone wants to add? Yeah, I think we're Well we're getting more Americanized and stuff. Uh, with like the Hollister and Abercrombie and Fish and stuff like that, but um, the likes of River Island, Top Man, or Top Shop for you. Um, River Island. Yeah. Oh, Top Shop and Freemark. Freemark. You know, there's one in Edinburgh. P R I M A R K. That's the cheapest clothes ever. But they're like here, I can buy them and bring them over because no one else wears them. But then in Edinburgh, you're gonna have like you're up in the street and see someone wearing exact same clothes as you because they just a bunch of the Asian people probably make like a thousand of these a day for like ten cents. So it's probably not the best clothing to buy. But this costs like five dollars for like a shirt or something, so yeah. It's pretty That sounds like a good souvenir for So you honestly <laughs> if, never know. If, you take these, if you take these girls there they will be in there for like an hour. They'll have a whole basket full and they'll spend like eighteen pounds or something. And honestly it's ridiculous. I love it. It's amazing. What's the name of that story? <laughs> P R I M A R K. Yeah. Is that Freemark? Freemark. Well, some people call it Freemark, some people call it Freemark. I don't know which one's right. I call it Freemark. There's one is right in the city centre, so you'll be yeah, you'll be able to get to it. And yeah, it sounds pretty cool. And that's like the typical British style, kind of, so. Are you like, would you be like easily picked out in the crowd? Is it more dressy? 
Um, I guess we were like, what we come back to is like, um, I don't know, like, yeah, uh, sweat pants quite often, or we dress up. the The main difference I've noticed is, like, for example, like a lot of people wear tight clothes, and as you can see with my jeans, they're like tight to my legs. Um, but in this country, everything baggy and stuff. That's probably the main difference um, that I've noticed in anyway. Does male and female? Yeah, and it's much. Yeah, it's I'm much female, less. Um, female, much less like the likes of like the t-shirts with like the funny jokes on them that guys wear and stuff over here. Not really. No one really wears anything like that in the UK. Um, so it's more conservative. It's more like yeah. It's more. It's just more plain and or more. It's dressy, I guess. Yeah, more fancy. So going to a restaurant and I would be okay in jeans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could be, you know, read them in care yeah. about the stress and the stress. They're too drunk to know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you better else? Thank you so much. This has been very, very interesting.